All right, everyone, thank you for coming to the uh, University of Texas Energy Symposium. Uh, this week, I think many of you must have gotten the note on who was speaking today, and it's not me, but the uh, only thing I have in common with the speaker at, the, at this point is the color and shirt and the same set of shoes. So um, I'm not wearing the shoes today, if you check. I, I normally wear the same set of shoes. Um, next week's speaker uh, will be Dave Nagel from George Washington University. He'll be speaking on low energy nuclear reactions, uh, known to some of you perhaps as cold fusion. So we'll, uh, we'll go from electrolytes to cold fusion next week. Uh, today's speaker, of course, is Dr. John Goodenough from here uh, at our own University of Texas. Um, he has not always here at University of Texas. He's gone in the 70s from MIT Lincoln Laboratory, uh, inorganic the head of the Inorganic Chemistry Lab at Oxford, and in 1986 he came here uh, to join us at the University of Texas. Uh, he obviously has many uh, accolades, which I'll just read a few and then stop talking so we can get to the real speaker, but uh, member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, Sciences, and Inventors, uh, foreign associate of the Academy of Sciences of the Institute of France, uh, similar institute in Spain, Royal Society of UK, so all the major Western countries of science there, uh, giving him his due, including Japan, laureate of the Japan Prize, Presidential Enrico Fermi Award 2009, the National Medal of Science, the highest science honor in the United States, Charles Draper Prize of National Academy of Engineering, Thompson Reuter Citation Laureate, 2015, and the Sheila Sampson Prime Minister's Prize for Innovation in Alternative Fuels for Transportation in 2015, and he also has over 800 refereed journal articles. So uh, without further notice, Dr. Goodenough, please come up and give us your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Well, I don't mean to be apocalyptic about my opening statement, but modern society runs on the energy stored in fossil fuels. And this dependency is not sustainable. We live in a throwaway society and we plunder the earth and we've come to the realization that if we're to be, have it sustainable, we have to be able to recycle. But you can't recycle a fossil fuel once it's burned. Moreover, the exhaust gases from the burning of fossil fuel are already choking large populations of people in cities like Beijing or in India in Jaipur and Delhi. And the same gases are contributing to global warming. So we have to find a way to get back to depending upon the energy that comes to us from the sun. Now the solar energy can be converted into electric power, but I must say the windmills are the best at the moment. The photovoltaic cells are much too expensive. But you can take the electric power that's developed from the solar energy and you can transport it to centers, distributed centers, but the time that you have for harvesting the energy is on a seasonal and diurnal time scale that is totally different from the time scale of demand. Therefore, we have to find a way to store it. The best way to store electric power is in a rechargeable battery. So we're left with the question, can we store safely in the battery solar generated power and delivered on demand at an acceptable rate and cost. Oh, that's our issue for the day. Let me begin with 
the idea of batteries. A battery can be a single cell, electrochemical cell, or it can be many cells. Large-scale batteries are many cells. For example, in the Tesla car that is so celebrated these days, you have 7,000 cells. They all are identical and they must be uh, programmed so that they discharge at exactly the same rate so that one cell doesn't run away from another. And the cost of managing those big cells or these big batteries is equal to the cost of construction of the cell. Now they have a problem not only of cost of construction and so on, but they don't last very long. And after two years, you got to turn it in and pay another 28,000 smacks to uh, replace it. So it's fine for the people who like to show off that they can do a, <laughs> have a Tesla car, but uh, it's not very practical. So what does a battery do? A battery delivers power. It stores chemical energy, and it delivers it as power in a discharge current at a discharge voltage for the time delta T that it takes to complete the chemical reaction inside the cell. So there are just a couple of things I've written down here because we need to use them. The cell capacity at a constant discharge current is the big QI, that is the capacity, which is usually in units per unit volume or per unit weight. And so the stored energy density then is the product of the average voltage of the discharge voltage times the capacity, which tends to get smaller the higher the current that you draw on the battery. So we'll have to keep those things in mind when we think about choosing the electrolyte. So let's just remind you of the components of a battery cell. It consists of an anode, which is a reductant, and a cathode, which is an oxidant, and the electrochemical reaction between the anode and the cathode essentially is what is the driving force for the power output. And these are separated by an electrolyte. And the electrolyte is a cation conductor, which I label as capital M plus. And it's an electronic insulator. Why? Because the chemical reaction is, has two components, the ionic component and the electronic component. The ionic component is transported inside the cell, but because it's an electronic insulator, the electrolyte, it forces the electronic component to go outside the cell where it does some work. The voltage, I put down the open circuit voltage because you'll see in a minute that the actual discharge and charging voltage are different, depends upon the chemical potentials at the anode and the chemical potential at the cathode. Now you'll notice I've drawn here the electrolyte. The discharge current is going to be modified by the area of the electrolyte divided by its thickness and by the conductivity of the ionic conch cation that is being conducted inside. So you need a large ionic conductivity, and you need a large area over delta L. And therefore, the problem is, how do we make very thin electrolytes separating the anodes over a large area? And that may be all right when you have a liquid, but if you have a solid, that may become a little bit more of a problem. The other thing there, I've got two lines there, and those are the interfaces between the electrodes and the electrolyte. At those interfaces, you form electric double air capacitors. 
in order to be able to equilibrate the Fermi energies on either side of the junction, all right? And that's going to be important because people who have objected to certain things that we propose have forgotten that fact, okay? <laughs> now, the electrolyte also restricts the voltage. An electrolyte has a window, and I'm plotting here on energy, and the electrolyte has a lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, a LUMO, and a highest occupied molecular orbital called a HOMO, and there's a gap between where there are no states. But you want the electrochemical potential of the anode to have an energy less than the LUMO. If it's more, it will give its electrons to the electrolyte and reduce it. And you want the cathode to have an electrochemical potential that is above the HOMO, because if it is below it, it will take electrons from the electrolyte and oxidize it. So you need, if you have a mu A or a mu C that is outside that window, then you require a passivation layer, which is referred to as an SEI or a solid electrolyte interface. It is a passivation layer. And when you get those passivation layers, you find you don't get a very good cycle life. And if you don't have a good cycle life, you have to replace the battery and it costs you. So the problem is uh, to, to try to keep the energy gap. Now we'll go to aqueous electrolytes. You know you're restricted to 1.23 electron volts. The reason you go to lithium in an organic electrolyte in the lithium ion battery is because you can make that up to about three volts. If you use a solid, you could make it very big indeed. And that's what we will try to get to. Now, a rechargeable battery stores power by applying a charging power. And that means in a rechargeable battery, the electrochemical reaction has to be reversible. And the discharge voltage has the open circuit voltage we refer to minus a polarization. The charging voltage has the open circuit voltage plus an over potential. All right? That means that if you were looking at storage efficiency, you would expect the power dispar charge over the power charge would be less than 100% because the polarization and the over voltage will get you. Now, as I said, if you have an SEI layer on the electrode, you have the problem that you may get what's called a capacity fade due to the problem that when you uh, discharge a cell, you take ions from the cathode, and if you put it into the cathode, you change the volume of both electrodes. When you change the volumes of the electrodes, the interfaces between the electrode and the electrolyte are difficult to maintain. If you have a solid, if you have a liquid, it's okay. If you have a polymer, there may be enough elasticity in the polymer to give you a little give. But when you have a solid, solid-solid interfaces are difficult to maintain. All right? But I'm going to, at the end, if I ever get there, <laughs> talk to you about the possibility of having an efficiency greater than 100%. Now, let me tell you, the referees don't believe it. <laughs> How do you have a possibility of efficiency greater than 100%? Well, we'll give you an experiment that shows that's just what we can have with a special electrolyte, all right? So let's talk about the electrolytes. First, we begin with an aqueous electrolyte because your standard battery was always with water. And the nice part about water, you have it acidic or alkaline, and you have a very good proton conductor, H+, goes fast, but the 
electrolyte has a gap of only 1.23 volts, which means the open circuit voltage is restricted to 1.5 volts. And therefore, you need a very large Q in order to be, have an energy density that's worth anything. But if you use air as the electrode and have a good uh, catalyst, it may be possible to get a big enough QI to give you an energy density, which is OK. So there are people who are interested in a zinc air battery because they want. But if you have an air battery, don't drive it on the highway where there's dust. <laughs> it might power up your cathode. But it may be OK for stationary battery, all right? But remember, if you're a battery designer, and you have a product in mind, and everybody's going to want a battery for a different purpose, and I don't know which one you want. What about organic liquid electrolytes? As I said, the difference between the LUMO and the HOMO gives you a possibility of a 3 volts for a long cycle life. Now, normally, in your lithium-ion battery, you, you have an anode, which is graphite, and it has a, 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 a chemical potential or Fermi energy that is above the LUMO of the electrolyte. Not only that, so it forms an SEI layer and has a problem always with capacity fade. <clears throat> Moreover, when you try to plate lithium, you form dendrites. Those are little whiskers that grow on the anode when you charge it. And they grow right across the electrolyte, which is a liquid, reach the cathode, give you an internal short circuit, thermal runaway, and fires, or even explosions. So the Boeing disaster cost them a billion bucks or so was because they had a battery manufacturer that didn't know how to control so that they wouldn't get these short circuits and wouldn't get the fires. But there are some advantages to having a liquid. You can put the salts in. It'll give you a good lithium ion, good sodium ion, or good potassium ion conductor. They have a fast enough Ionic conductivity, about 5 times 10 to the t minus 2 Siemens per centimeter. And it accommodates, because they're liquid, on the cathode side, the volume changes that occur in the, in the material. So there are people today who think you can't do, possibly get by with solid electrolytes. Let's stick to the liquids. They have the fast enough ionic conductivity and they can accommodate the volume changes. And as I said, you, with the liquid carbonates that they use, you can get a, a long cycle life if you keep within the window, and the window will give you a possibility of 3 volts. And the people at Hydro-Quebec make a uh, Li4Ti5012 spinel anode, and a, olivine LIFEP04 cathode, which have their chemical potentials within the window, and they get 10,000 cycles of a long cycle life, and they have it for a wind farm collecting, uh, storing energy from a wind farm in northern Quebec. And so they're in a position to try to sell this for people to back up storage for the grid. Okay? That's fine. However, by the time you do that, those cells are, do not have the volumetric capacity or the gravimetric capacity that you need for a car. And we'd like to find a battery that could power an electric car so that we could get spewing of all these gases off the highways. All right? So let's go on to the next one. Here's the lithium-ion battery. It has the liquid electrolyte. Unfortunately, there was some certain things that didn't come out on there. But on the, what, what they have is they started out in 1970 at the first energy crisis 
thinking they'd make a TIS-2 lithium cell. It's a layered compound. You can put the lithium in and out because the people, Jean Ruxel in, in, in France and uh, Robert Schulhorn in Germany had been still exploring in the 1960s the chemistry of putting lithium in and out reversibly of a layered sulfide. And uh, the Exxon Mobil company thought, well, we'll go into business and we'll make a lithium TIS-2 cell. So they hired the two folks from Stanford who were there, and the first thing they know, they had fires and explosions. Dendrites. So that program was canceled. <laughs> so at that point, seeing I had to find something for students to do, <laughs> I said, well, I know we can take lithium out of a layered oxide. We'll take an LiCO2, and you can pull the lithium out. And I'm curious, how much lithium can you pull out before the thing begins to fall apart? Because oxides won't form layer compounds by themselves. There's too much electrostatic repulsion between the oxide ions. And we were busy showing that you could get higher conductivity in that oxide than you could in the sulfides and that you could get a four volt charge versus lithium. And the people in Japan had, uh, and I forget the names of the Japanese, I hope they'll forgive me, <coughs> that uh, had looked and said, with well, all these dendrites, what we need to do is to find something besides lithium for the anode. And if intercalation is what you do, We'll use graphite, and we'll put a little bit of lithium in the graphite. Well, that was nice, and so that's what they have here. That's the graphite. And, but I had said, you see, you can't make the lithium cobalt oxide very well as COO2. You have to start discharged. Therefore, you have to make a discharge battery, not a charge battery. But I said it's... After all, it's a rechargeable battery, so it doesn't matter. We'll make a discharge cathode and we'll pull the lithium out. We'll see how much we can pull out. Nice little project for a student or a postdoc, okay? So, Kuichi Mitsushima came from the uh, University of Tokyo to uh, be with me for a year, and I said, well, that's a little program for you. And so, we explored cobalt and nickel and chromium, and chromium didn't work for various reasons, and the cobalt and the nickel did fine. So, while we were doing that, somebody else in Japan said, fine, I will take the other people's graphite and good enough oxide, and we'll make a discharge battery by having simple graphite, and we'll insert the lithium from the cathode. That was how the lithium ion battery was developed. But that has the problems of the liquid electrolyte. And I've said it has, if you want the window and you want to have long cycle life and so on, people have been trying very hard to do all kinds of fancy uh, things of how to make different kinds of electrodes so that they could increase the capacity a little bit. They end up facing the fundamental problem, okay? So they've been able to get as far as a hybrid car and allow you to charge it overnight for, while you're sleeping. But if you want an all-electric car, you want to drive it in, and within 10 minutes, you want to be able to charge it up and get off and on your way. Can you charge it that fast? Not with this material, because if you do, you plate lithium on the surface of the graphite, and then you get dendrites. All right? So there are people who believe that since the problems that I'll come to with the solid electrolyte are so bad that the only way to do is to continue trying to fight their way through with a liquid electrolyte. Well, 
there was a general feeling that you could never plate lithium anode from any kind of an electrolyte without dendrites because when they made a solid electrolyte with a garnet, they found <coughs> those little whiskers went right through the grain boundaries. Well, so we said, uh, I had Legong, who was a postdoc with me, and we need something to do. I said, Legong, let's make a liquid, a liquid electrode at room temperature. So we took a sodium potassium that was a, an alloy that is liquid at room temperature over a fairly wide solid solution range. And he took it and he dropped a drop of it on the liquid electrode, the, the carbonate electrode that was in a separator of either cell guard or glass fiber. What happened? You see, it went right into a little ball. What did that tell you? Well, the next thing he did was he put some carbon paper, put it out on top of the ball and heated it a little bit. And a 420 degrees centigrade sucked everything up inside the carbon paper, meaning it wet it. So that showed very clearly that the secret of being able to plate an anode with an alkali metal was to make sure that it wet the electrolyte or it wet a mat that the electrolyte was sitting in. All right? So that was an important concept. And now people, oops, excuse me, people are making and plating dendrite free anodes from a liquid through a carbon matrix of some kind. All right? And it appears that the SEI layer or the changing because they're inside the matrix is not changing its volume as you plate, and so you're not getting a big capacity fade at the same time. Well, we'll see how that goes. But the liquid electrolyte remains flammable, and people are not going to be interested, I think, in a flammable liquid on the highway for very long, because it will only take one or two accidents, and it goes dead. All right? And there's your investment down the hole. So what's the alternative? The alternative is, a, well, can you do anything with a solid electrolyte? Well, there are different kinds of solid electrolytes. You can have a crystalline ceramic electrolyte. You could have a polymer electrolyte. You could put a polymer on ceramic as an electrolyte. You could make a composite of polymer in a ceramic electrolyte. And you can have an amorphous dielectric ceramic, which I will call the Braga glass. OK? <laughs> now, the ceramic crystalline electrolyte is brittle. And you want to make a large area of material and a very thin thickness. And all you have to do is go over a big bump on the road, and you might get a crack, and then there may be a problem. And so, not only that, but you have a solid, solid interface at the cathode. And when the cathode is changing, are you going to be able to maintain a solid, solid interface? So you say, well, then I'll put the polymer on the ceramic. I'll have a ceramic, and I'll put a polymer, and the polymer is a little bit elastic, and maybe I can do something, and it works reasonably well. But, but these polymers and ceramics are poor electronic conductors. The best you can do is 10 to the minus 3 Siemens per centimeter. And remember, you've got to have a very thin material if you have only 10 to the minus 3 Siemens per centimeter. And how are you going to make it strong? Well, you put the polymer in a ceramic and make a composite. And then you can get a fairly mechanically robust, even flexible, as you will see, electrolyte. So maybe we can do something with these solid electrolytes. 
Now, I'm going to talk for a bit about garnets because that's lithium ion. You can do a nazicon, you can do sodium ion things. And on those slides, I don't have the name of Yu Tao Li, for which I forgive him. I ask him my forgiveness. Somehow it didn't get on the slide, but let me acknowledge that what I do with the garnets are done with Yu Tao Li. All right? Now, you can have a big enough window that the garnets are, and the nazicons are not reduced by the metallic anode. And you can plate out, and you can plate with a fairly low resistance to the cation transfer across the electrode-electrolyte interface. Okay? And you can increase the mechanical stress strength by introducing a polymer in a ceramic composite. But the best ionic conductivity you can get is only 10 to the minus 3 Siemens per centimeter, which is less than an order of magnitude than what you can get with a liquid, and therefore the operating temperature is above 55 degrees centigrade. All right? But let's look at the ceramic. You know, Utah was with me as a student for a while, and Wepner had said, look, you can make Li7 with x equals zero in that formula up there, and you can get 10 to the minus four Siemens per centimeter. Maybe that'll be good. Not quite. So we doped it a little bit to see what we could do, and the optimum doping with a tantalum, or you could do it with niobium, but Tantalum is a little bit more stable. It's not reduced by the lithium uh, anode. And it has Siemens, 10 to the minus 3 Siemens per centimeter. Because it has a three-dimensional space consisting of lithium and tetrahedral sites that are bridged by octahedral sites sharing common faces, exactly as in the spinel. The problem we found quickly was that trying to work with these things didn't take much exposure to air to find you contaminate the surface of the grains with lithium carbonate. And that is a disaster. That's why the dendrites went through, and that meant you couldn't get good interfaces and so on. Well, Utah went back to, to, to savor his, his, uh, his degree and get married in China, and then he decided to come back for a postdoc, and I was very happy to receive him back. And he figured out, well, I know how to get rid of that lithium carbonate completely. And when I do, and I have a lithium garnet free, I will make... He makes a cell, which is lithium, and the olivine LIFEPO4, which we developed. And he uh, puts a little polyethylene glycol as well as some polyethylene oxide into his garnet. And you see, you can bend it and twist it and do all kinds of things with it. And now you've got a solid electrolyte that you could make into a pretty good membrane. That's a good step forward. And so he shows this. But he's only up able to get to 1C, which is pretty good rate. And he's able to light things with a crimpled and rumpled up affair here and get a pretty good uh, uh, efficiency. But he's still under 100% efficiency. Well, now let me turn to my final chapter. This is the dielectric Braga glass electrolyte. You see, if you want a successful career, you've got to have a little luck. And you've got to have some good people come along and decide they want to work with you at the right time. And I had just figured out how, what we should do for wetting when in comes 
This lady was brought to me by Andy Murchison, who's sitting here in the front row with her. And he said, I've been working with this young lady in Porto, Portugal, and she has a very interesting material. It has a conductivity of 10 to the minus 2 Siemens per centimeter, over than that, about 2 or 3 times 10 to the minus 2 at 20 degrees centigrade. That's as good as the liquid. Oh. And it can conduct lithium or sodium or potassium, like the liquid. That's pretty good, isn't it? It also has a dielectric constant, which is very big. And she was a physicist, and she was very interested. Oh, what I can do with the, with the di big dielectric constant, in this, I mean, the big permittivity in this material. Now, a Andy has recently also quite independently shown that with different polymers, we can make thin, mechanically robust polymer membrane, just like you Tao did with the, with the garnets. So the glass can be made that way. You can also apply it as a slurry over a large area. And when it dries, it comes back. No, no grain boundaries to have a problem with or anything. But it is a little moisture sensitive. So you do have to have a good glove box. And you do have to work at a glove box and, in a dry atmosphere a little bit. But that, if you have a good dry room, you know how to handle things. Anybody who makes lithium batteries knows how to do that. So it wets alkali metals. It is not reduced by lithium anode. It has a low impedance by perplating and stripping. We're still working on it. And we'll give you, as far as the cathode is concerned, an update of where we are. But this is what she brought to me, this slide. I was interested, so this red line there is an Arrhenius plot of the log sigma. And you can see that the activation energy for the ion movement is very small. And you can extrapolate it back. And we've looked. And indeed, you can go below room temperature and still have pretty good conductivity. OK? So at room temperature, it looks fine. The other thing that's there, as I said, is got a big permittivity. And we will see that the combination of an electric dipole and good cation conductivity is able to do things that are surprising, that the people who are, in the, who are conventional electrochemical people don't want to accept. What can I do? <laughs> All right. So the first thing I did to her is I said, I want to make sure, because she made the glass with hydroxides and so on, and there was a little water. And we had to, she convinced me she was dry. She'd done things, and she knew how to make this glass in such a way that it would be completely dry. And I said, well, let's see if we can plate. So we made a symmetric cell, lithium, lithium glass, lithium. And I don't know how many cycles has been going. It's been going on, but it's over a thousand cycles by now, and uh, and so very low impedance and so on. The little steps here are simply the, the things that change as a function of temperature. And she and I will have to have a discussion a little bit more about that and the, the dielectric the variation of the dielectric constant with temperature. But there we are, and so. We can plate. So essentially, we solve the anode problem with this solid electrolyte. Because even though the volume changes on the anode, to wet means you have to have a strong bond between the anode and the electrolyte. And that constrains the change of volume to be perpendicular to the interface. And you can accommodate that with a little spring in your cell, all right? So consider the anode problem solved. I do, anyway. <laughs> but we have a, now a fast electrolyte, anode problem solved. What about the cathode? That's a tough one, because it's a solid. 
Well, if you can plate on the anode, maybe you can plate on the cathode, because that's what you're doing in a symmetric cell. You're plating on the lithium, you put it over, and you're taking the lithium from one side and putting it on the other back and forth. So now we don't make a symmetric cell, we make an asymmetric cell. We make a cathode which has a different chemical potential than the anode. And we plate on the cathode, all right? And we regulate the voltage you get by putting a particle or a molecule which gives you the chemical potential that you want that is still below the maximum you can get which would be th over three volts, and we have made three volt cells, but of course, the competition says, it's impossible, you're violating thermodynamics. Well, of course, Elena Braga is very smart and a good physicist, and she, she sits down and whips off in the back of her head. Of course, I, I teach this in my classes after all, and so, I know perfectly well that thermodynamics is being obeyed, but they'd forgotten about the, electric, the, 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 the chemical potentials, or the, excuse me, the, 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 uh, the electric double layer capacitors at the interfaces of the anode and the cathode. And so they missed the point. So we have a rebuttal in, 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 in press, I hope, at least it's been submitted. <laughs> Not a problem, I think. Now, what could be simpler? You just remove it from there to there. And if you, you can get a three-volt cell, and you make it without having to do some very complicated business on the cathode, you just plate from one to the other. But we haven't optimized it. And I think we have yet to determine how, how, what about the rates at which we can do it, okay? But that's work in progress. I'm just letting you know where we are. <laughs> but since they questioned us, here we are, and we use, uh, they started out with uh, doing a lithium sulfur cell, and you calculation, you should get a start with 2.6 volts, but it goes quickly down to 2.51, and it's fine, and then it begins to reduce the sulfur, and uh, it, after 2.36. But they had a cell that went for 28 days, I believe, and one discharge. It wasn't a very big current, but it was there, and I said, you can't do that unless you're plating. So we looked, and indeed, we're plating, you take something from here, and in order to demonstrate, we first showed it by eye. You take the thing apart and look, and you can see the lithium on the cathode. Here we say, well, all right, you want something? So we put XPS spectra showing we had the lithium there. And they say, yeah, but you haven't done the thermodynamics. So she did the thermodynamics, all right? <laughs> People don't like something that interrupts their prejudices. Okay, so here with a different relay, we've got a three volt cell. And I don't know, that's been cycled, I don't know how many times, but thousands of cycles of giving this three volt cell with this. Now I've only got two more slides. Your patience has been very good. And this is an aluminum copper cell it had been charged and discharged, but discharged. Then it was never charged. But we hooked up, first of all, Andy's showing you here that we have a, a, a ceramic or a, an electrolyte with some polymer in it that can bend and so on and be flexible. And we're lighting an LED. Now, the LED is electric dipole. The electrons can only go in one direction through the LED. So we know we're discharging. All right? But we never charged it. We're getting a self-charge. What do you mean self-charge? Nobody ever heard of a self-charge before. 
the simple fact is this material is different because it contains electric dipoles as well as cations. And it's because of the interaction between the two and the electric, I mean, the, the double air capacitors that the things that you're able to get this phenomenon. I haven't got an opportunity to go into it here, so I'll just stop right there to say we can get a self-charge. But it's important for the next step in my last slide. No, my next to last slide. <laughs> so, what are you going to do for the cathode? Well, we tried plating, but maybe there's an alternative way. I said, well, why don't we just put something soft there? Let's put something like a polymer, you know, on our glass, and then we can use a conventional insertion compound. Well, I had said, because we were dealing with polymers and with the polymers to get better conductivity, I thought maybe a cyanide ion would be better than a thing. So they dug out this succino nitrile, which is an electric dipole, which has got cyanides on the edges of two carbon-carbon in between. And these are called plasticizers because they're only held together by dipole-dipole interactions. So that's plastic enough. But you'll see here, the ionic conductivity is lousy in it. And yet, and yet, This is, now, you can double the, she's done twice as many of those things, but they take quite a long time to do because it's a deep discharge and deep charge. And you see, it's starting out already with a capacity that is this, what you get using the cathode material we had and the amount of nickel manganese spinel we had. And as you keep cycling, the capacity keeps increasing. And the efficiency is the capacity of the discharge divided by the capacity of the charge. So this is an example of an efficiency which is greater than 100%. And that's why it can be long. And with these kind of batteries that we're doing, we've cycled them. I think she's got a battery that's gone 13,000 cycles. Not bad. All right? And the capacity is going up. Well, that's where we are. Thank you for listening, and I think I'm done. <laughs>
a charging part as well as what you apply by the external charge. And when you do the efficiency, you have the sum of the self-charge plus the applied charge divided by the charge. That's why you get better than 100 percent. Yes, sir. Yes, spike loud for old ears, but that's okay. <laughs> you've told me in the past that you've been successful because you're getting up there in age and they get all these awards, and therefore the longer you live, the more awards you get. But I'd like to ask you about your beginning. When you made fundamental decisions about what you were going to do in this technology spectrum that you're so successful at, how did you make those decisions and can you report that process to the young people here. Well, he's asked, you all want to know what's the secret of being able to still be working and having fun at 95. <laughs> and how, how, how did you ever, and of course, you know, when I left the army from World War II and I came to uh, apply, I was given an opportunity to go to University of Chicago, and old Simpson at the University of Chicago looked at me and he said, I don't understand you veterans. You're too old. Don't you know that anybody had accomplished anything in physics, had done it by the time he was your age, and you want to begin? <laughs> well, all I can say is I felt a calling in my heart. I don't know if you people have a religiously minded enough to know about being quiet and listening and having a feeling in your mind that you've been called to do something. But for me, I had studied classics, I had studied philosophy, I had studied that before I went into the army, and I had felt that somehow I was supposed to study physics, that I was supposed to do science. And when I, the war ended, I was given an opportunity because I didn't have any money. I had to put myself through undergraduate school. And we didn't pay the graduate students at my time. You had to <laughs> <laughs> and so I was given an opportunity to study physics. And I knew I wasn't going to be a good card-carrying theoretical physicist, but I thought that's what I'm supposed to do, so I signed up. And somehow, I managed to survive with the 10% of us in that class that survived. Fermi's rigor. Now, he made you take a 32-hour qualifying exam before you could go on to go to graduate school. Eight hours a day for four days. And you had just been told, you just go to the library and you'll know about physics. Read. <laughs> All right? So that's why I've turned out to be a maverick. <laughs> because, and I knew I wasn't able to be a, a theoretical physics professor when I finished my PhD. After all, my professor had said, I think we can use uh, uh, thermoelectric power, the Seebeck voltage, to do cooling for the furniture and so on. And I looked at the problem and I said, I don't think, Clarence, that you can get around the Wiedemann Franz law. Oh, you're not a very good student. So I got fired. <laughs> 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 and so that's okay. You got to be prepared to take a few knocks on the way. And um, so I didn't take the fancy jobs. I took a job at the MIT Lincoln Lab where there would be engineers and ceramics people and physicists working to solve a targeted problem for the Air Force, which was how do you make a digital computer that will function? And I found my scientific voice because I was able to bring physics and chemistry together. And I had the good fortune of being put in charge after we solved the memory problem of the computer to uh, take over. And I had to make a choice that somebody 
take the position that I'd want to do. I'll tell you one more story because it's important. We thought when we'd solve that problem, we'd go up to the, to the boss. He'd call us up to his office and we'd go, well, maybe we'll get a raise. <laughs> no. What he did was, thank you, gentlemen, for solving my problem. Now that you've done a good job and worked yourself out of a job, what are you planning to do? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a good lesson, too. <laughs> so I don't know. All I can tell you is don't rush for what seems to be safety and this, that, or the other. Follow the calling in your heart, and maybe, maybe, maybe it will lead you someplace. Okay? Well, uh, I want to come back to the uh, solid electrolyte. Uh, uh, okay, uh, you said the uh, the capacity is increasing uh, with cycle, cycle number. So, does it mean that the solid electrolyte, the lithium uh, glass electrolyte, uh, has changed in composition or or in phase, uh, which can make the capacity increase? Well, the the, the what During I call the a glass is an amorphous ceramic. Yes. And because it's amorphous, I call it a glass. It contains the dipoles, and it requires a little aging, because you have to get the electric dipoles to begin to interact and to order themselves before they let go of the lithium, and then the lithium becomes a very good conductor inside the glass, OK? So it just. You just don't make it like that. You have to make it and age it a little bit. And there's a few little tricks to get the good material. But it's just an amorphous ceramic. So um, have you thought about the extent to which capacity can be attributed to self-charge theoretically? Like how long do you expect this increase in capacity to continue? Okay, just my legs have gone, that's all. <laughs> huh? How long will the capacity continue to increase? How long can I? Will the capacity continue to increase? Oh, he wanted to know how long will the capacity continue to increase? Well, normally that capacity increases to a certain point and then it, it, it flattens out a little bit. And I must say, not only is there self-charge, but there's a self-cycling that goes on as well. And you'll see these oscillations that are going on inside the material. It's a long story. I, I, I can't do anything in three minutes. But it does increase only to a certain point, and then it bends over. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the, your question. Yes? Uh, how quickly can you charge, and how quickly can you discharge without damage? How quickly can you charge, and how quickly can you discharge without causing damage? Well, let me say, in this particular cell, we seem to be getting a fast charge and discharge because it has a large capacitive component, uh, I mean, hydrostatic component in the storage as well as the Faradaic component, and the electrostatic storage is fast. So that component is very fast. And uh, what we have a lot more work to do to optimize these materials and get the speed. But uh, this is a surprising result and a very good result. And probably Elena Braga there sitting in the front row will tell you, oh, the old professor, you don't expect him to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Charging it. This one is, is the slowest one. We, it's a deep charge and a deep discharge. We are just using 23 milliamp per gram, but we have used 153 milliamp per gram in the cells that were running for uh, 13,000 cycles. And this one has more uh, 200 and uh, uh, this one is now at 250 cycles.
There has no. to be some theoretical limit to. So there is a there is a the, the, the theoretical electrochemical. Sorry. <laughs> 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 so there is, uh, there is uh, here, as the professor said, that there, there are two components. The electrochemical is is uh, the the capacity is given by the capacity of the cathode that we have overcome when we overcome that first that first point, which is was the first charge. Um, and then we have the electrostatic storage. So that one is the one that we. Uh, we are able to calculate for a certain cell, and that uh, sums to this one. Okay. We have to optimize relationships with the amount of electrolyte and so on in order to get optimized. It, you ask, I have to speak when they ask me to speak before I can get to the, to the final, to the final, final, okay? <laughs> So in terms of the efficiency, um, have you all been able to actually try that in like a series or in a parallel circuit with other batteries behind that? And what was, what was that efficiency like then? Okay. So, <laughs> Not with these cells, with these cells, these cell, the study of these cell, uh, of these kind of cells with the SN, uh, it started uh, nine months ago, so this cell has eight months. We didn't make any series or parallel. But those aluminum copper cells, yes, we have done. That is a very interesting study that we have to, to uh, keep on doing with that, that in series and in parallel. Um, but with these cells, we didn't, we didn't make these, the, the, the study yet. But we have several other cells of this kind and um, those cells are the one. Actually, I, I don't think this one shows the efficiency to, a hundred, to more than 100%. In most of the other okay. cells, you can see that. This also we'll, depends we'll on, the, on the amount, uh, well, on the voltage, of course, that you discharge. So here it doesn't show. But, but in the other cells, we have, we, we, we have the, 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 capaci the, the capacity the efficiency of more than 100%. Can you put two and one together? No. no. Yeah. yeah, well, that's fine. But I don't have to put more. Okay. You hungry? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just one last question. So what are the next, what are the next steps in your research, Dr. Goodnight, for, for this? Well, the next steps are we are going to try to optimize these cathodes. And we're hoping that some battery company would like to license and develop, because I'm not a battery developer. I'm not going to try to go into business at 95. And, because uh, <laughs> that's too much work. So, <laughs> so, so we're hoping that uh, we'll have some partners that will uh, want to use some of these things in their batteries. But we have so many skeptics out there that are throwing cold water all over that the people don't dare invest because they say, oh, well, maybe he doesn't know his thermodynamics. Well, we do know our thermodynamics. <laughs> kind of hard to contradict. So I don't know if you're a fan of uh, Ayn Rand or Atlas Shrugged, but it sounds a lot like John Galt's uh, invention of uh, harnessing static electricity from the atmosphere, right? So what people didn't believe. So. Uh, thank you very much, John, and thank you, Elena, thank for you commenting as well. Um, okay. Have a good supper. <laughs>